I've just pulled this out in the middle of the Gadget Mountain, so it's time to take a look at it. Uh, this was sent in some time ago by Hugh, spelt H-U-W, Hugh. Uh, Dear Clive, in this packet you'll find a dodgy mains filter. I forgot what it was originally attached to, some eBay purchase no doubt, but it was attached to an IEC lead and I found that while in use everything was fine. Once I'd finished using the item the filter was attached to, I'd turn it off using the switch in the appliance and again everything would be fine. However, maybe one in three times when I went to unplug the filter, the RCD at the consumer unit would trip whether I turned the socket off or just pulled the filter out of the socket without switching off. I'm not sure when this photo was made, but I can't find a trace of the old manufacturer and the colour of the plastic suggests that it's quite old. I wonder whether it's faulty or if it has always behaved like this, but is of a design that predates common use of RCDs. So, this is indeed an old filter and we should immediately open it up and take a look inside and see what the circuitry is like. I shouldn't think it's going to be too complex. I'm going to guess it might have some metal oxide resistors and capacitors and inductors, but who knows, might even have some weird transformer filtering system. Okay, so this is a plug. It's got a little neon stuffed up here that goes up to match the connector there. So it is designed to be terminated into plug style -y. That, uh, was that earth wire loose? No, no, it's tight. It's just the actual uh, thing moving about inside there. Okay, well let's get the wires out in fact, it's going to make it more accessible. The crimped seems quite, seems quite nice construction initial glance. Right, so that is the point you'd terminate your uh, flex into and it's got a cable grip so it's quite good that sense. Here's what it is inside. It's got a fuse. It's got metal oxide varistors. Look at it. It's got thermal fuses next to the, the uh, metal oxide varistors, which is good because they tend to feel quite hot. And then it's got filtering capacitors and what could well be either just one coil or it could be a common mode suppression choke. Let me get this out further. I'm not sure how this is going to be connected to the pins in the back if there's just going to be wire links or friction. I doubt it's going to be the sort of friction contacts. Okay. Oh, that looks quite, that's quite an expensive uh, construction approach. They've got the terminals coming uh, from the uh, plug connections to specific directions to match the circuit board. That's quite expensive, actually. That's a lot of bits of custom metal. Most companies have just used wire links these days out of cheapness. So what do we have? We've got live coming in the back here and going through a fuse. It's then going up to here and then it's going down through the thermal fuse is the other fuse on the neutral? Neutral. Yes, the other thermal fuse is in the neutral. That allows possibly for protection. If, it, if one of these is connected to earth, as it may well be. There's a wire link going across here. Strangely, it says it's got a wire link over where it says gas discharge tube GDT. Oh, there's another one. R4, all right, R4 or GDT. Why would they have a gas discharge tube if a link was needed? A gas discharge tube, uh, if that's what it is, would have been a little, uh, it's basically two metal caps with a, a portion of gas in between them. And once you reach a specific voltage, it arcs over inside. But they've got a link across here. Maybe they just designed it with multiple things in mind. And that link is going to a metal oxide varistor here. So uh, the reason they've got it thermal fused on both the live and the neutral then is that if uh, polarity was swapped in the plug or if it was, it might be designed for universal application with non-polarized plugs, it means that whichever, uh, can, if the 
Metlock's visitor fails to ground, and current starts flowing from live to ground via that and it starts getting hot. Then whichever polarity it is, one of these fuses, thermal fuses, is ultimately going to end up breaking the circuit. So what have we got uh, beyond that? I tell you what, you know what, to save time, I shall doodle this out. I'll be back in a moment. The deed is done. Let us explore this further. So we've got the supply coming in. It goes through that standard fuse, that's this fuse here, and then through this thermal fuse. And the neutral also comes in, and it goes through this thermal fuse. Immediately after that is this Class X2 suppression capacitor, which is 220 nanofarad, rated for, well, rated for 275 volts, typically. 275 volts AC... 250 volts AC, which is reasonable enough. That means it's got a fairly high... Uh, typically the DC voltage rating of these capacitors would be around 630 volts. But um, the, the Class X2 capacitors, the suppression capacitors, are often rated for AC voltage of the supply they're going on because typically they are just connected directly across between live and neutral. So directly after that is the first of the metal oxide varistors. It's the one at the end here. And it is a 275 volt AC uh, metal oxide resistor, which means that it's rated to handle up to the peak of the uh, AC voltage without uh, starting to conduct. But above that, it will gradually start to conduct and it will basically shunt any high voltage spikes. Then we've got a neon, which I didn't note down the value of the neon resistor here. It's, uh, oh, it's quite high. It's uh, red, violet, yellow, which is 270k. Oh. 270k. So the red and the violet yellow is two, seven and four zeros, 270k. And it's in series with this little neon bulb. That's quite good. Quite often they'll cheat to get the brightness up in the neon. They'll use a lower value resistor. And in this case, the I don't know how much use this thing's seen, but the neon is completely clean inside. If they overdrive the neon for brightness, it will go black inside, which is completely com defeats the point of trying to make it brighter in the first place. And the resistor itself shows absolutely no sign of excess heat, so that's absolutely fine. Then comes what turns out to be a common mode suppression choke. And what that does is that uh, if, if the supply that's coming in, the output here will be going out from these points, the live output. Oh, I've just drawn a four. Uh, neutral. And then the earth will just be... The earth isn't actually going through this in any way. It will just be common from the main earth point here. But um, what happens with the comm mode suppression choke is that current flowing through the inductors induces current in the magnetic toroid. And the point is that the windings are arranged in such a way if there's common noise coming out of something on both legs, they will actually counteract each other. And basically, they'll act against each other and it'll be like a transformer that's inducing current in the opposite direction. So it suppresses noise coming back out of the appliance onto the mains network and creating radio interference. Ultimately, it, it'll also uh, prevent noise coming from the network, common mode noise on live and neutral, coming into the appliance as well, theoretically. After that, there's another class 2 capacitor, 220 nanofarad, that's this one here. And then there's two class Y capacitors, I'll just put Y. And the point of a class Y capacitor is that it's rated to, it's a, usually a very low uh, value because it's leaking a small amount of current onto the earth and if the earth circuit was open that could give you a modest tingle but it also has to fail in a safe state. You can't have one of these capacitors fail short circuit uh, because it could then potentially pass a lot of current uh, to the earth connections. So they have those two connected, bet one between live and earth and one between neutral and earth. And then here's the really odd bit. The other three metal oxide varistors here are actually forming a sort of a star configuration with live, neutral, uh, and earth all looped together. And the voltage rating of these is each 150 volts AC, which means that combined, the two in series, theoretically, gives 330 volts. Uh, 300 volts, should I say. And... I'm not sure. That's quite an odd arrangement. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of metal oxide varistors being connected to Earth. Ultimately, it does. It clips lightning transients and spikes, ultimately. But the failure mode of metal oxide varistors is that if they could uh, absorb enough transients, they gradually break down, they start conducting, and they start passing current on a regular basis. 
So what was making this unit trip out randomly when it was being unplugged? I'm reckoning that as it was being unplugged, any arcing was possibly inducing spikes, even maybe in the uh, inductor here. And they may have been causing, it may have been cu coupling electrical noise through these capacitors. Any electrical noise would have been coupled through. So if it was high frequency, it could amount to a fairly high current through these little class Y capacitors. But also any high voltage transients caused as the circuit was broken, particularly if there were appliances plugged in, uh, could result in spikes that uh, turned the metal oxide varistors on briefly and let them pass current to earth. But one of these is the culprit, the capacitors or the metal oxide varistors. And I think both could actually, it just depends on the situation. High frequency noise, it would have been the capacitors. High voltage transients, it would have been the metal oxide varistors that were doing that. I'm not sure. You know, I've not opened. Well, I have. I opened the washing machine uh, uh, inductive filter. It was a lot simpler. Uh, I'm trying to remember what it had. It had the basic capacitor arrangement, but it didn't have the metal oxide varistors, I don't think. It may have had the common mode choke as a filter. Not sure. I'll have to open more filters and take a look inside and see what modern filters look like. But this is one of that era. Fairly old and, quite frankly, quite a well-built unit, actually. It looks... It doesn't look mass-produced. It looks like it's been made in relatively small quantities by uh, people who designed it based on absolutely standard components um, and a replaceable fuse inside for extra protection. Uh, that's quite good. So it's an interesting uh, thing, so I'd like to thank Hugh for sending that. Um, I'm so used to Hugh being spelled H-U-G-H that I'm not sure how to pronounce pronounce it when it's spelled H-U-W. Who? Uh, not sure. But uh, there we go. Uh, that's the schematic of a vintage plug-in suppressor.